In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I kindly invite you to greet our Blessed Mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it's a great pleasure to share uh, some of my own experience of faith through the charismatic renewal, the Catholic charismatic renewal. Um, are we listening correctly? Is everything okay with the, with the sound? Yes. Okay, good. I would like to uh, take this presentation through five steps. First, a few notes on myself and my own experience of the Holy Spirit and the groups of prayer. Secondly, about the novelty of the charismatic renewal. Third, some limits we have come to know about. Uh, number five, this will be similar to Michelle's a presentation about the challenges, current challenges, and uh, number five, some proposals for uh, our own time. Probably uh, you will listen to some aspects of the charismatic renewal that you have heard already. My um, um, invitation is that if you hear something that you have heard before, well, probably it is because that is quite important. <laughs> so, um, if something is repeated, it only means it is really important. Michelle, as you know, uh, comes from England. I come from Colombia. So, if two people so separated in the <laughs> in on Earth are telling the same story, well, probably that means that that story or that aspect is very important. So a few notes on myself. As a child, I met the charismatic renewal when it was just entering into my country. I have to say that I am a little elder than the charismatic renewal. This year, please God, I will be 53. And as you probably know very well, last year the charismatic uh, renewal was 50 which means that I was in my childhood when the charismatic renewal was spreading all over the world. And when I was about nine or ten, I had my first encounter with the charismatic renewal. Uh, it happened in the city of Cartagena. Most probably you have heard of Cartagena because of tourism. It is on the shores of the Caribbean Sea. It's a very popular destination for tourism, international tourism. And I was there with my family because of some um, aunt of mine that is a religious person. She is a religious, consecrated woman. And she was living there. And we, we as a family were visiting her. And at that time, there was a meeting with a priest. And that priest was Rafael Garcia Herreros, who was one of the first, one of the founders of the charismatic renewal in my country, in Colombia. And I remember quite distinctly that time and that first group and people gathering and saying praises to the Lord and raising their arms and some chanting, uh, very simple, very, very joyful songs. Well, that was an experience that clearly impacted my childhood at that time. But it remained as an isolated event. Uh, it was the first encounter, but it, it didn't have uh, a continuation, so to speak. Then, three, uh, two or three years after that, I had a second experience. And this time it was with a non-Catholic, a Protestant group. And the reason for that was that they were inviting people from very different de denominations, but they were not presenting themselves 
as evangelicals or protestant but they were simply saying that they were christians so there was some kind of misunderstanding and my mother invited me and i went with my mother to that place and i also remember the theme of the songs and the praising the lord and um, that kind of um, very very um, uh, very live presentation of the gospel it was it was really powerful. And the aspect that I remember chiefly of that um, time of belonging to that group was the testimony of a young man that used to be uh, addicted to drugs. And he was telling us about his own conversion and the power of Jesus Christ changing his life. I remember it, it was about 40 years 40 years ago, but I remember very well. And he said to us, we were youngsters, we were teenagers at that time, and he said to us, well, my life was absolutely worthless, or so I thought. And then, when I was trying to recover from yet another, another fall because of the drugs, when I was trying to recover, someone came to my bed in the hospital and told me about Jesus the Lord. And at that time, this is this man speaking, and at that time I thought, well, anyway, my life is completely useless. It's completely worthless. So let's give Jesus a try. Let's give Jesus a try. And that was exactly what he did. And he made a short prayer and he commanded and he delivered himself completely and absolutely to Jesus Christ. And at that time, his life began really to change. And that was very powerful. And this was a powerful speaker. And we were very impressed because of this testimony. Also, in this group, there was a special gathering for the calling of the Holy Spirit inviting the Spirit to pour upon us. And it was a very special meeting because we were prepared for some weeks in advance. Um, there was a sort of expectation about that gathering. And then this same guy was praying over us, just simply asking the Holy Spirit to make himself present in our souls. And what I can remember is that at some point I was crying and I couldn't understand why. Why am I crying right now? What's the sense of this? So it was, it was really powerful. It was beautiful. But there was something that I cannot remember with the same joy. And it is the fact that they were not presenting themselves in full honesty what they were. So they were not telling us that they were not Catholics. In some sense, they were fishing, trying to get some Catholics for their group. So this is not completely, this is not completely correct. So that's not the way. You are meant to say exactly what you are and what you pretend and where do you come from. Probably that's even more honest. So at some point, first my mother, not, my, not, not me, First, my mother discovered this whole truth about this group, and then we decided there are some aspects that are very positive and very interesting, and yes, the Holy Spirit is powerful, and yes, the Holy Spirit can come to your soul and can make really wonders in your heart, but this is not the way. So we left that group. That was the second stage of that time of my life. Then. Next, um, next, <laughs> next step in this, uh, in the, on this way, my father and my mother, with myself, um, began to attend a group. This was clearly a Catholic group, and it was under the direction of a couple of Dominican priests. And what I remember of that group was the abundance, abundance of love. What I saw was exactly that. These 
priests are not the most educated ones, they are not the most clever people in the world, but they have something. And what is that something? Just to, um, to make myself a little clearer, I was 15 at that time, and I was very, very attentive to what they were saying and the way they were preaching. And I remember they have love, they have power, they have fire, fire. There's fire in their words. The way they spoke about the Eucharist, about the Blessed Virgin, about the Church, about God changing lives. So there was something. And that clearly left a powerful impression on me. That was my third encounter. But then, well, uh, now we are coming to a very dark period, dark period of my life. And it began in a very simple way. There is something that is called International Mathematical Olympiads. And this um, academic event, which is held internationally, of course, was coming to Colombia. That was 1981. I was finishing my high school, and I participated in the Olympiads, in the first Colombian mathematical Olympiads. And well, it went, it went really good, it went very well, to the point that I, I was chosen to represent my country in the IMO, the International Mathematical Olympiad, that was to be held here in the States. That was the first time that I came to this beautiful country. That was 1981. So it was really moving, really impressive. Uh, and then in 1982, I went to Hungary, to Budapest in Hungary, to attend the next Mathematical Olympiad and then began, there began in my soul a different kind of love. At the beginning, I was really in love with God, as you can imagine from the previous experiences that I have told you. But now, it was the academy, it was science, it was mathematics, and I was really fascinated, fascinated with that world, with so many geniuses, so many smart people from different countries. I remember the great mathematicians from the States, from Vietnam, from Japan, from Russia, well then the Soviet Union. When you saw all that genius is all really smart and really, really intelligent people gathered. It really caused fascination in myself to the point that it began, it started a period of real idolatry. Science become, became my idol and I began to idolize science and step by step, I left the Mass, I abandoned prayer, I left the groups of prayer, I left almost everything. I can say, honestly, that I really came to the brink of atheism. I was really at the limit of becoming an atheist, because I was so completely in love with science and the power of science and all that. But then, something really good happened. On the side of the exterior of mine, so to speak, and also inside myself, from the exterior, God was calling me in a very unexpected way. We were four children. I am number three. Number two, whose name is Carlos, invited me to attend a group of prayer, again, 
in my own parish in Bogota. My world had changed a lot since I told you of the groups and the priests and all that. I was far from that. But this invitation of my brother was completely unexpected and I decided, well, let's go with him. And we went to the group of prayer. It was long, it was boring. <laughs> I saw no reason to stay there, except that there was a very nice and beautiful girl. <laughs> so that I went to that place and when we went out, my brother asked me, well, what do you think? Will you come back? And thinking of the group, I was about to say no. But thinking of the girl, I said, oh, it's OK. We can come back. And certainly, we went again to that place. Next week, we went to that place. It was about 30 people, the usual setting, uh, the songs, the praise, and all that. But there was a problem. The girl never came back. <laughs> but God was doing something, was doing something. And that second time, even if, if I thought this is boring, this has no purpose, even if I was with so much pride and arrogance in my heart, the Lord was more powerful and was calling me, was recovering me, was calling me again to his life and his friendship. Eventually, I came to realize that I had some things, but there was a lot that was missing in my life. I could see the jubilant, the joyful, eyes and smiles and hearts and hugs of these people. And I thought to myself, I don't have that. I am missing that. I could have other things, good academic results, good promises of higher and higher and higher studies. At the time when the Lord was calling me just to resurrect, my spiritual life, at that time, there was a serious proposal of doing a doctorate in pure physics in Germany. So my life was very different, very different. But I, I received the grace. Now I understand it was a grace from God. I received the grace of having appreciation about what I did not have. I don't have what these people have. And what they have is this kind of joy and purity of heart and capacity of selfless service. I don't have that. So eventually, I stayed in that group. And bit by bit, God was recovering my faith and was recovering my heart. That happened on the side of the exterior, as I say. But inside me also happened something that I couldn't fully understand at that time, and probably I am not completely understanding now. I was studying physics pure physics in the Universidad Nacional in Bogota. That, that's what I was studying. And I remember that we were entering a course, uh, some subject about analytical mechanics. That was the subject. And we had really good teachers. So uh, this lady was teaching us about the very principles of analytical mechanics and the equations and the different aspects of that. And it was interesting. But she was really good at teaching 
and she was really slow in making sure that everyone was really understanding. So she was too slow for my taste. And I began to feel, well, this will be a very long course because of this slow motion in explaining the subject. And at that time, and I can tell you where, where was I sitting when this happened. I was, well, taking my own notes, but a bit bored about the, the subject. And I felt deep inside me, I felt it would be beautiful to see the Blessed Virgin. This came <laughs> out of the blue. This came from nothingness. I cannot understand why I was studying analytical mechanics and then this deep wish, this profound desire to see the Blessed Virgin. So I scrubbed my head and said, probably this is too much physics. <laughs> I have to do something about this. And I tried to avert my mind from that thought. Because, as I told you, I was at the verge, at the brink of atheism. No prayer, no mass, no, interesting, no interest on that kind of subject. But after some days of this repeating wish of seeing the Blessed Virgin and coming to know the Blessed Virgin and visiting the Virgin, I said, this makes no sense at all. But at least I should come to know whether or not there is a chapel in this university. Because I had spent some years in the university and I never had had interest in coming to know if there is a chapel. So I began asking people, you know, is there a chapel here? Is there a Catholic chapel in this university? And eventually someone told me, yes, you can, this is a very big campus. Yes, you take this way and then to the right and then to the left and you go there. Okay. So I went to that place, a very simple, big chapel. And I sit there and I didn't know what to say <laughs> because I was beginning to forget the basic prayers, even that. I couldn't remember the basic prayers. So I just stay seated. But there was something in the place, a sort of quietness and silence. So it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't bad. And I eventually began to visit that place many times, just thinking about my own life and thinking about what I had done in the day, and I began to realize just how much, how much self-centered I was. That wasn't beautiful, but that I didn't know exactly what to, what to say or what to, what to make of that. Eventually, the chaplain of the university, a Catholic priest, saw me so many times in the chapel that he told me, there is mass here, almost saying to me, there is something that is called mass. <laughs> <laughs> There's mass here and you can attend. And, and that I did. So I began attending the mass and this man, the priest, was a very, very nice person, very nice person but very, very bad preacher. <laughs> he was terrible as a preacher. <laughs> so my faith was challenged. <laughs> <laughs> and I was wondering, he, he has to know that he's not doing well as a preacher, but clearly, He's doing his best, 
and he has love in his heart, and he has commitment, and he tries every day, and he's honest. So I was stuck in that place because I could see the good intention of his. I could see that there was something in his heart. And then he invited me to attend a small group of prayer. So what you are listening now is the process of God resurrecting a person. That was what was happening to me. So he invited me to a group of prayer and then Lent came about and he said to us, well, it is good to make a good confession. Have you heard the word confession? There's something in the Catholic Church called confession. And after so many months or years, I made my confession and I started again to receive communion and then the group of prayer because this was at the same time happening. So I can tell that the Lord was reaching out to me with his two arms. Outside me, inside me, he was calling me because he was in love with me. And at some point, at some point, my friends, I couldn't deny it. At some point, I couldn't deny that he was so great, so patient, so merciful. I almost cannot tell this without feeling what you probably feel in my voice. He is love. He truly loves people. He is good. He is merciful. Not because someone else is telling to me, but because I can see it in my life. So this group of prayer in my parish and this action of the Lord in my life in the university really changed everything. So when year 1984 came and there was some trouble in the university, some strike, general strike in the university, I made up my mind and it was the decision, not mine, but decision by, from the Lord. Something really different has to happen in my life. And I told my parents, I cannot continue in the university. I cannot continue. Well, but you are a good student. You remember that story. You're a good student. You have good results. You have good marks. There is a doctorate. Germany is waiting for you. No, 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 this time I cannot deny my Lord. This cannot, I cannot betray love two times. This cannot happen. And so I left the study of physics. Well, in some way, I remain myself close to science. I am very much interested in science. And it is really important in our time. The problem is not science. The problem is when we idolize, when we make idols of things. Beauty is important. But if we make beautiful things idols for us, it's our wrong. It is not God's wrong. Everything, everything that God has made is perfect and beautiful. The problem is our heart when it takes as idols things that God has given us simply as instruments to come to know him. Well, now the novelty, second part, the novelty of the charismatic renewal. I like to say that the charismatic renewal has a very powerful, very powerful impact in making witnesses out of simple believers making witnesses, people with the courage and with the inner strength to tell others, this is true, this is true. I am not repeating something, I know by myself. This kind of experience is so necessary in our time, so necessary. The world needs 
witnesses, witnesses, people that can say, I know, I know from the bottom of my heart, from my own experience, from my I have seen, I know that it is true. And the charismatic renewal, with that emphasis in the power of the Holy Spirit and the action of Christ in our own lives, is the perfect instrument to make witnesses out of simple believers. Secondly, the charismatic renewal has a great gift in the Catholic Church also because it has put the Holy Scripture in our hands. Having the Bible, having the Holy Scripture, and understanding, coming to understand that this Scripture is for me. It is not an old text just to be deciphered by someone. This is a word that is meant to act upon me, to act upon you, to act upon families, communities, and countries in this world, now and here. This conviction, this absolute certitude that the Word of God is alive and powerful now on our lives is a great gift from the charismatic renewal. And this is part of the essence of the charismatic renewal. And we cannot, we cannot lose this without losing the gift of the charismatic renewal. Number three, frequent and very joyful prayer. Frequent and joyful prayer. This is another aspect of the charismatic renewal. Joy. It is so necessary, so necessary. It is the very difference between news and good news. Joy. How can you tell the world that Jesus is the good news if you don't feel and transmit and irradiate the joy? That kind of joy, that kind of inner gladness is something that cannot be, cannot be represented like a theater. It is something that you have it or have it not. It's something that people can feel. So the practice of being joyful in the presence of the Lord, for example, singing his praises or dancing for him or chanting or speaking in tongues, all that, all that, my friends, is something that has the capacity of making yourself someone worth believing. Because you are good news. You, you yourself become good news. There is so much sadness, there's so much despair, there's so much hatred in our world that a person that has the gift of joy becomes himself or herself becomes good news. And that's part of the essence of the charismatic renewal. Number four, of course, the use of charisms. Charisms. Probably you know that the word charisma in Greek means gift. It is a gift. The use of charisms is receiving the gifts from the Lord. Probably there are few, very few things that are more rude than rejecting a gift. If you come to me with a gift and I say to you, not interested, keep the gift for yourself, oh my, certainly you would feel that it is not the gift, but yourself who is rejected. 
Well, we have done that to God for decades, probably for centuries, rejecting his gifts. And I, and I am glad in thinking that the charismatic renewal is an openness to the gifts of the Lord, like saying, this time I am ready and I am willing to receive whatever gift you have for me. It is not, it is not demanding from God. It is not a transaction. It is not trade. It is not trading with God. It is just receiving. Because remember, it is God who is willing to give. It is God who is willing to give. So, when we are willing to receive, then the bridge is complete. Then the connection is complete. The gifts of the Lord, they are not something that we are demanding or trading from God. It is something that He Himself, because He is love, it is something that He is willing to share with us. It is willing to give. So the charismatic renewal, it is not the only movement in the church that is doing this, but the charismatic renewal is exactly that. Is receiving the gifts from the Lord. We are willing to accept because you are willing to give. It is beautiful, isn't it? Then number five, from the essence of the charismatic renewal, outreach and evangelization, openly proclaiming Christ as the Lord. Evangelization. I can tell by myself it, it is great, it is beautiful, it is difficult to put in words what you, what you feel. I remember when I was landing in a plane to Kaohsiung. Kaohsiung is the main city to the south of the island of Taiwan. It was um, an aircraft from China and we were landing I was the only Colombian <laughs> in that plane. And the only reason, the only reason for being there, the only reason for being in that aircraft, in that airport, in that city, in that country, the only reason was the gospel. And I thought to myself, it is, it is you, it is you, Jesus Christ. You are the reason why I am here. I am here because of you. I have come here because of you. Because of you. And then I had the opportunity to go into South Korea and to Japan and to Macau and to Hong Kong. It is not only the gift of sharing the good news, it is also witnessing the power of the Spirit in different cultures. Let me share with you something that happened to me in Hong Kong. The Dominicans of the province of the Holy Rosary have their novitiate in Hong Kong. And most of the young men that are beginning their novitiate over there are from South Asia. Some of them from Vietnam, from Myanmar, from Korea and other countries that you cannot imagine that the Lord is doing so marvelous things. And I, I remember from that experience, I remember especially a guy from Vietnam. All his family, the rest of his family, were half atheists, the other half Buddhists. He was the only Christian in the family, the only Catholic in the family. And through internet, he entered in relationship with these Dominicans of the province of the Rosary. And he wrote to them in English. And they replied, it is necessary, the English language, if you want to make the novitiate with us. But he had very, very poor English. And he had no opportunity to go into any academy 
or a school of the English language over there. So eventually, he managed to get some old discs, you remember the black discs, to learn a language, like 20 or 30 discs, long play discs, teaching the English language, and he taught himself English in order to serve the Lord, being the only Christian and the only Catholic in a family of I don't know how many people. That's the level of love of some of these consecrated people. So I am saying this just, just to remind you that there is so much work that the Lord is doing in many, many places. And when you have the experience of being loved well, well, well above all your wildest expectations, when you have that kind of experience, you have to tell the universe there is a God. There is a God and He's powerful and He's alive and He's beautiful and He's graceful and He deserves every, every breath, every breath of mine. So that's the kind of experience, if you are truly a charismatic, if you have the experience of the power of the Holy Spirit, you know what I am talking about. You know what kind of experience is this. This need of going, of going beyond the limits. Beyond the limits. I lived in Ireland for six years and eventually I went also to England to preach for short stays in, in, in England. And you can see that there are limitations, probably many limitations to, to the use of the English language in my case. But I know something. The Lord is beyond my limitations. The Lord is beyond my limits because I know that He has broken so many frontiers and so many limits to reach my heart and to change my life. So I am sure that He is able to use me and to use you to get to other people and language, culture, race, way of thought will not become a wall that could prevent him from loving people. He is so powerful. He is the expert in breaking barriers and reaching people beyond every possible limit. This is the kind of faith that you receive when you have a true experience of the Holy Spirit. When you receive the Spirit of Pentecost, when you know that in Pentecost that the Lord was breaking every barrier, every frontier, every wall, every limit, you began to think, I myself will not be a problem for God. <laughs> He's far more powerful and more intelligent than myself. Number six, openness towards ecumenism. This is very important, true ecumenism. I am not speaking here of uh, ecumenism of the minimum or ecumenism of the minima, no. Ecumenism of the minimum means that we are not to talk about what is different between you and me, no. True ecumenism means the capacity of a speaking of whatever is common, but also with charity and truth about what is different. And this is the true ecumenism that the Holy Spirit will give you if you are a true charismatic. And then, it's part of the essence of the charismatic renewal, the fruits of engagement with the life of the church. Some of us, even as consecrated people, engagement. That means that you feel that you have to do something. This is commitment, this is engagement, this is the, the need of doing something. So you stop being just a spectator and you begin to be a person that is involved, committed, engaged, doing something. 
implicating yourself in what has to be done. So this is a synthesis of the novelty and the essence of the charismatic renewal. But there are also some limits. Let's be reminded just for a few minutes about the limits so that we, with the power of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of the Church, can overcome this kind of limits of the charismatic renewal. Not always, not always, not everywhere, but there are some difficulties. For example, an overemphasis on the extraordinary. There is this kind of thing in some places, at least in my country and other countries I have seen that, overemphasis in the, in the extraordinary, so that if there is no miracle, if there is no something extraordinary or very emotional, the Holy Spirit is not close to that place or close to that preaching or close to that person. Well, beware. It's not a good idea to associate so strongly the Holy Spirit just with the extraordinary. Sometimes the Holy Spirit also, also, guides our life in very ordinary ways. And they are also the ways of the Lord. So do not prevent the Lord from guiding you through very ordinary ways. Remember that the Blessed Virgin, for example, was not having an Annunciation every day. So it's not every day that you have an Annunciation and the, and the showing up of the angel and the miracles. Not every meal is multiplication of the bread. So be ready for the extraordinary, but be ready also for the ordinary. Second, in some places the charismatic renewal has had some lack of attention, lack of attention to the material needs of the poor in some places. So that we are so engaged in a spirituality that maybe we forget that there are people that are really hungry or thirsty or homeless. Be careful, that could happen. It is not good that our spirituality makes us astray from people in need. We have to be at the same time close to God and close to the people of God. You cannot, we cannot forget any of those, uh, of those shores. Then number three, there is also some risk of individualism. Individualism, just my experience, my experience, what I have seen, what I feel. Be careful, be careful. Remember, please, the first letter of St. John chapter one. And remember that the purpose of the evangelization is that you and me become a we. It is becoming us, it's becoming a we. We together, the church. So we have to be very careful because sometimes, because of such, of such insistence in the individual and very particular action of the Lord in my life, I can become a sort of individualistic person. It is always the case that the Lord has loved us and has loved the church and is building up a people and is building up his temple of the Holy Spirit. So we have to be careful about that. Number four, there is also some risk in some quarters, there is some risk of being elitist, elitist. We are the spiritual people. The rest of the world know very, very little, if any, very, very little about God or about the gospel. Please be careful, that's not good. Life is full of surprises 
And sometimes you can find people that are far more spiritual and far more charismatic and they did not belong to your group. You remember that passage of the gospel when some of the apostles, I think it was John, who was telling the Lord, hey, we saw some people that were casting demons, but they do not belong to our group. So we tried to forbid them. And the Lord said, eh, don't do that, don't do that. If they are not attacking us, if they are not against us, they are with us. So we have to be careful because elitism is always a temptation for every group, for every movement. We have to be very careful on that. And number five, another temptation, lack of discernment on ecumenical relations is what I mentioned before, the ecumenism of minimums. It's when we keep ecumenism at the lowest level. It's not a good idea. Remember, it is good that we have clear, clear knowledge of what is in common. But we have also to keep clear, a clear mind about what is different in different groups. Not, not to worsen the situation of the gap or the difference with other groups, but just to be honest. This is why I told you with some detail the experience that I myself had in my childhood and the very bad that I felt when I realized, hey, these people are not completely honest. So it is not good. We have to be completely honest about our belonging and what we truly believe in. And the only way of doing this is with true ecumenism. Well, there are new challenges from our own time. I only will mention two of them without developing the idea. Scientism, scientism, which is the ideology of affirming that the only truth is the truth that can be discovered by science. Oh, this is a true obstacle in the preaching of the gospel. And also a new challenge in our own time is um, what Bishop Barron, Bishop of Los Angeles, what Bishop Barron calls self-invention. The idea that I can become whatever I want. Even if I was born a man, I can become a woman. And if I, uh, if I am a sinner, by an act of thought, I can uh, save myself uh, so that I can self-invent what I am. And that self-reference, continuous self-reference, is really harmful to the gospel because the gospel entails the idea of surrendering yourself to the power of Christ the Lord, to the mercy of Christ the Lord. And in self-invention ideology, what you are saying is that it is you who determines by your soul decision who you will become. So it is really, really in opposition to the gospel. These two ideas, scientism and self-invention, are two really difficult cultural blocks that are refraining, that are preventing many people from coming to the gospel and coming to the church and coming through, through living uh, their faith. So we need, we need a new formation, a new preparation, a new set of mind so as to face this kind of obstacles. And this leads me to the final part of this talk. Some proposals. First of all, please keep fresh in your memory the story of your own conversion. Keep fresh in your memory. Be ready, be ready to share with anyone in any circumstance what the Lord has done for you. Keep fresh in your memory the story of your own conversion and the story, the story of love that God is doing with you. Second, number two, please educate, educate yourself about some basic apologetics. This is a difference 
from the cultural background that most of us knew 30 or 40 years ago. When I began knowing the charismatic renewal, the cultural background was very different. The atmosphere, the cultural atmosphere was very different. Now we are in a rather different situation. There is strong, explicit, continuous and systematic opposition to Christian thought. Probably you have heard the expression new atheism. People like Richard Dawkins, like Peter Singer, like Daniel Dennett, Daniel Dennett, uh, people like Christian Huygens, these kind of people, they are, they are actively preaching atheism and they are presenting Christianism as the main obstacle, as the main block, stumbling block, impeding culture as, as, as a fact to move forward. So we need real preparation. We need more, more formation. It is not only, it is not only with enthusiasm or emotion or feelings or sentiments. We need all that. Of course we need that. But it is not only that. We need really formation. So everyone, everyone departing from the point where he or she is, has the duty of educating himself or herself in these aspects. Please, basic apologetics. And I, if I need a reason to convince you of doing that, just think of your own family. Many parents are encountering real difficulty just transmitting their faith to their own children. Because at some point, children as young as 12 or 10 are telling their parents, it is not necessarily the Christian faith. Darwin told us otherwise. End of the conversation, end of the dialogue. If you don't have some basic background and some basic apologetics about these hot topics, that's the end of, of, of your conversation. So if you say, well, the Lord has, has done really wonders in my life, yes, it's okay for you. If that works for you, mom, it's okay, but leave me alone. So you need something in order not to stop the dialogue just because they mention science or just because they mention evolution or just because they mention some politics or things like that. We need more formation. Please educate yourself about some basic apologetics. Number three, strengthen our groups of prayers, our groups of prayer with real Catholic formation. Well, we already have that. The next one, avoid, please avoid sterile discussions. Sterile discussions. Well, this is a commandment that comes from the Apostle St. Paul. Avoid sterile discussions. But I have to say something that is connected to the time we are going through. Please take this into account, especially regarding Pope Francis. This is so sad for me to say, but there are lots of discussions about Pope Francis. Why is he marrying people in an aircraft? for example. Why is he saying this? Why is he? My kind invitation is, most of the time, you are just wasting your time in that kind of discussion. Probably, probably, there are some, some places and some gatherings and some people with whom you can have this kind of dialogue or conversation with some good fruit. But most of the time, 
the best course of action is just to leave the things as they are and to say, well, the very basics of our faith, as they are stated in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, that is what I am preaching, that is what I am sharing. But avoid, please, sterile discussions. If you are to preach the gospel, if you are to share the good news, be very, very attentive with whom I am, I am having this conversation. Is it something good? Is, it, is there something good that I can reasonably expect from this conversation? If there is not, don't waste your time and don't harm the church with that kind of discussion. We have to be careful on that. It is not that these um, issues are uh, forbidden from us. It is not. It is only that be careful with whom you are having the conversation so that there is a positive expectation of having some good fruit. Then, number six, please, we have to come back to the biographies and the writings of the saints. Holy people, they are a great treasure of our church. There is so much good example. There is so much powerful intercession. And there is so much wisdom that is in the writings and the biographies of the saints. We have to come back to them. We have to recover these jewels so, so that we make these treasures our own and share with the people. Many of the troubles that we are having today, many of the difficulties that we are having today are not new. They are new for us. But other people have gone through the same difficulties. So it is just wise to go to them and to learn from them. And my final point, be the first. Dear charismatic, Catholic charismatic people, be the first to serve in your own parish and your own diocese. We have to be people that proclaim in words and deeds that we are truly committed to the church. We are not just pulling things our own way or towards our own goals. We are interested in what is the great love of Jesus Christ, and that is the church. My friends, thank you for your time, thank you for your presence, and thank you especially for being so committed to loving God and making him known. Thank you very much. God bless you.